I remember very well in 1986, I was just five years of age. I didn't care about the war that broke in the, this country. I was just a happy man who valued my parents are there, they will sort out all the issues which is happening. So even as the bombs were flying everywhere, as the rebels were coming, they had already overtaken the parts of Kampala and other places. They were now approaching Gulu. And uh, actually they overtook the government and formed a new government from military uh, forces. And I remember that they uh, born a twin with my twin sister. We ran from our homes and went to the woods, deep in the forest there, hiding there. For us, we thought it was hide and seek play. <laughs> so one of our cousins would go and hide himself under specific uh, uh, trees and leaves to protect himself. For us, we would sneak from the parents, go searching for this man. And when we come behind him, we tap him to make him scared. We thought it was a game. So that was the beginning of war. Now, when this new rebels group took over power and became like a new government, a rebel group was formed to fight this new government. And this was now the beginning of a serious conflict that never ended. And that is the strongest memory that I have in my childhood, the beginning of war in Northern Uganda. And when this new government came, Northern Uganda was seen as a stronghold. And they worked so hard to crush the stronghold. So anybody who formed a rebel group to fight this new government was seen as a good person who is going to help us fight this new government that did a lot of uh, uh, atrocities in order to fight the new government. And um, it became a difficult thing. And the entire community, most of the leaders and people supported this rebel leader who formed with the sense that we are going to liberate this nation, Uganda, from this new government using 10 commandments. So they consider themselves as a holy people, a rebel group that is holy using 10 commandments. So the support was so big on them. And immediately when they started their work, they came with a, a very wrong belief that they can change stones into bombs. And people believe that. And they say they can even give you what they call a bulletproof from the government uh, bullets. And they claimed if you smear yourself with butter, which is from, um, she from sheer, uh, sheer oil or sheer butter, if you smear yourself, it is going to protect you. Bullets wouldn't catch you. And people believed it. Little did we know that this man was led by the spirit, which was evil. And he, he tucked himself, labeled himself, and called his group and his movement as Lord Resistant Army. And um, as months continues and they're not able to fight the government and win, we started seeing the evil part manifesting. They started abducting young children who are nine years to 12 were their best age. When they abduct you, they force you to first kill somebody in order to indoctrinate your mind to do whatever they want to do. And uh, they force you to kill your own mother, they force you to kill your father, to kill a sibling. And this child who has already killed a mother, he goes to the bush, I mean, as a rebel leader, I mean, a rebel child, he can kill anybody. And that became a problem. We started seeing them mutilating the lips of people, cutting the ears of the people. And people are saying, this is not what we thought. And from that moment, terror 
in the entire world of our country. The unfortunate thing uh, was that we saw the international organizations or international bodies never came for our rescue. And to this day, I have a very big concern that if there is nothing that affects international bodies, they don't care about whatever is happening anywhere. Uh, we suffered and for over 20 years. And I asked myself, where were the international bodies? It came to a point that we were forced to leave our own homes and put in camps. In your own village, you can't even reach it. We stayed in internally displacement camps. We lost our culture. We lost value of education. We lost uh, ability to work. We are known as the toughest hard culture in terms of work, but we lost it all. All what we want from people is handouts, and that became a difficult thing I saw. So the rebels kept on coming, abducting children, killing people, burning people in houses. They just get people, push them in the house, lock the door, and set the house ablaze. And you hear how people are crying and the pain, and, and uh, that became a difficult thing. And I saw what they call mental health disorders in the entire people of Northern Uganda. It was a painful memory. I remember very well when the beginning was like a game and um, I didn't fear about any guns, any atrocities that were coming because of the work of the rebels because I looked into my parents. If they're there, all is well. They're going to sort out all the problems which is happening. But I remember very well one day, uh, it was in the morning, when the family members were all together and my older sister left the house to go to a trading center where there is a shop where they can buy uh, some household needs and take it back home. When she reached the center, the trading center, found out that the rebels had already surrounded the entire village. We were in our home, we didn't know anything. And at that very moment, she ran and said, let us run. So the entire family started running. We wanted to enter in one of the Catholic hospitals and then hide in there because they would always lock the gate. We were late. We just bumped into the rebels. The entire family were abducted around 10 a.m. in the morning. Born a twin, I had my twin sister who was asthmatic when she was young and the entire family were abducted. We walked with these rebels. And at that time, they don't kill people using bullets. They use machetes to kill people. And um, they were holding machetes in their hands and we thought that was gonna be the end of our lives. And uh, we started walking with hundreds of other abductees. We walked with them from 10 a.m., 11, 12 noon, we are walking, heading farthest, farthest away from town to the trading center, deep into the village. At one, we are still walking, two, uh, we are still walking, three, we are walking, four, we are walking, five, since morning, we have not eaten anything. Little did we know that the government troops were following these rebels from behind. This memory struck us down when we heard bullets. The shooting was like rain power, like a downpour that is beyond just hearing a drop of water. Bullets was raining everywhere. Everybody scattered to run for their lives. We have gone so far from anywhere we know. We're young people that didn't know anything. My mother, who was holding our hands, walking with us, they're running, everybody scattered. I found myself jump into the hand of my twin sister. 
I think I was around seven years of age. At that moment, when I jumped into her hands, we started running, the two of us. All my cousins who were with me, all my siblings who were with me, my mother who was with me, we didn't know anything. We didn't know wherever they were. Everybody scattered their different direction. The rebels, we were running among the rebels. The rebels were also running. The unfortunate things, they were singing rosaries as they ran. So it reached a point that people had thrown any valuable things they were holding in their hands. Good things, because the rebel had made people carry food and other things. Everybody threw it, and you just jump over it. Nobody cared about anything except their life. It reached a point where everybody ran and left us. 6 p.m. in the evening. We didn't know where we were. We reached at a junction, which was like a V form. The rebels took the right with many abductees taking that, but other people were taking the left uh, side of the road. And uh, we followed this left side. <laughs> In my childhood, I still remember that very well. We ran together with this uh, twin sister of mine. At some point, I shouted, they have shot me because some bullets came closer to my ears and I could hear only one bullet. And uh, the family made fun of me, like, if they shot you, you have no time to say they've shot you. <laughs> you would be dead. <laughs> so we ran. And people would come from behind, overtake us. We couldn't even run anymore. We were just alone, walking. And I remember this miracle that I'll never forget in my life. We saw a woman, an old woman, who was coming from a distance. She was carrying a basket on her head. We even talked to ourselves, what is wrong with that woman? She's carrying a basket on her head and she can't throw it. When everybody has thrown more valuable things, we stepped over it and ran. That was our miracle. When this woman came closer, it was our grandmother, a mother to my dad. I'm telling you, I've never seen this miracle anywhere. She came and grabbed us and said, oh, my own, oh, my own flesh, oh, my own blood, with a strong utterance and saying, this is a miracle. If that woman never showed up there, to this day, I know where we ran and where our grandmother stays. Whatever she came from, whatever she was doing there, is unnatural. It is godly, very divine. She grabbed us. We walked with her all night. I remember the, the moonlight was very bright. We walked in the night until we reached now our village where we were born. Because this had happened in another location where we had ran away from our own village to seek refuge in another place which was not far from town. So when she took us home, we had the opportunity to stay with grandmother for about one and a half weeks. And I'm sure she sent message to mommy and daddy and other people don't look for children, they're with me. And that was the reality that I saw. It is no longer hide and seek. It is life and death that changed my thinking. The war that happened in Northern Uganda will take years and months and even decades for all to be recorded because everybody in northern Uganda has a story behind them, a deeper one. If you see anybody in northern Uganda walking on the street, that one has a lot of traumatic experience, a lot of snake bites that has happened in our lives. Uh, personally, so many things happened to me, to the family, to my siblings, to brothers and sisters. And, and uh, I'll just give you two examples that happened. 
uh, one day the rebels came home and abducted many people in the community. And uh, one of them was my sister. Uh, when she was abducted, she went with the rebels. We kept hearing somebody from the community has returned back from captivity. One month passed, one year passed, five years passed, 10 years passed, she never returned. And um, we, we even did the funeral. Um, because uh, in most cases, when somebody returns, we hear the stories of so-and-so is still alive, so-and-so is still breathing somewhere. For her, it's reached a point, it stopped. She never returned to this very day. Uh, that's a sad memory I have. Uh, another time that uh, happened, which was a serious big snake bite for us in the family. Um, every day, when it reaches 4 p.m. in the evening, you start to plan to go and sleep in the woods, in the bush there, under no roof, under trees, or just under the grasses. Sleeping in the woods or the bush was safer for us than staying in the house and you risk being abducted by the rebels or being killed. I don't know what happened to these brothers of mine. This time they did not go to sleep in the bush. It has never ever happened. You always have to sleep in the bush. And this time the rebels came that very day that they didn't go to sleep in the bush. They entered the house. They actually kicked the door. They kicked once. Very strong, energetic young people who just kicked the door and the door opens and they... My younger brother, who was 14 years of age, um, was right there. They grabbed him, shot him on the shoulder here, pulled him out. He wasn't dead put him in the compound, and they got a lock of wood, and they started smashing his head. My other brother, there were three in the, in the house. One is already dying here. One jumped out, running because of the death of the brother. He was shot. He fell on his knee and died like he was praying. And then uh, one remained. And um, the rebels entered inside. Two child soldiers who cannot easily carry even AK-47. A boy and a girl started pleading to the commander, please give me the boy who is remaining. I want to be the one to kill. They fight and compete who should kill human beings. And uh, the commander was just removing the clothes, the, the household things, was just getting it, packing it, to go with it. And um, soon my brother got out and pretended to be one of the child, or the children, I mean, in among them, and sneaked out and jumped out and started running. When he tried to jump to the bush, he knocked his toe right there and felt in front of one of the rebels who had a gun and was ready to shoot this brother of mine. But my brother just felt in front of him. So his thinking was, I want to reach a point where I hear the sound because it was dark in the night. I hear somebody running that way and just fire bullets, stray bullets there. One will catch him. My brother was just in front of him. So he thought, because he remained silent there. So the, the rebel thought, oh, maybe he had ran and walked away. He survived. Three years later, he ran mental. And people in the family was just thought traditional spiritual things and uh, they are thinking of something else. And uh, I remember calling a phone um, of my dad 
and quarreling like with no respect. I was so disappointed and so hurt with beliefs and traditions and culture that they think some spirit is going to help us and it never helped us. If the spirit that they, we treasure as tradition could help, why didn't they keep our family member? Why did they keep our... So I was very disrespectful in, on the phone with my dad and uh, culturally, you are supposed to be seen, not heard. So you respect your parent in that. So my very close friend, who was also my tribe mate, heard me speaking and he thought this is disrespectful culturally. He pulled the phone away from me. And uh, when I was, I was ending, before he pulled the phone, I was saying, take him to the hospital, take him to the hospital. And uh, that is when he was taken to the hospital. And uh, um, about two weeks later, he was discharged from the hospital. So he's still alive, but I still see a challenge in him. The war in Northern Uganda was a big strike in everybody. Um, we call it we had a lot of snake bites in our lives. When I say snake bite, I mean when you're bitten by a real snake, it is not the snake bite that is going to kill you. It is the poison that enters you that will kill you. In real life situation, when you're bitten by snake, people rush to kill the snake. After killing the snake, what next? The poison that is going to kill you is still in you and you will struggle in a big way. So we definitely tell people, and I believe in it, I've seen it, it is not the bite that will kill you. It is the poison. So it is an analogy which means an experience that ever happened to you, whether you kill somebody or you were forced to kill somebody or memories that happen in your life is the one that is going to turn into poison and is the one that is going to be traumatic that will kill you. The act of the killing does not kill you. The act of witnessing by seeing whatever happened to you or to somebody else, seeing and witnessing is traumatic. Memories related to what you saw is the one that is going to kill you. We call it snake bite analogy. Deal with the memories that ever happened to you before that memories turn to become poisonous and it will kill you. When we experience the war, personally as a family, this was a deep snake bite for me. How did I consider the snake bite? The question that came into me at that moment is, why my family? Why my sister? That was a big question. And at that moment, I was having a conflict between the spirit of tradition that we believe in and God that we believe there was and there is a creator. We just have it in our mind that there is a creator, but there is also a spirit. Why didn't they help us? That began to disturb me. And um, when it came to my brothers who were killed, we learned later that it was one of our uncles who brought the rebels. And as I talk even now to this very day, it has created a very big gap, hatred of some of my family members towards the other family. And that became a deep poison within me. Looking forward to the answer was a big question for me. How can I sort out the big question that why my family, uh, 
I had even resentment over the government. Why are they not helping enough? They have all the resources. Why are they not stopping these people? Because these children, when they're abducted and they're trained, some of them who escape, they say their training is on bullets. They train you, run and survive bullets there. They shoot you life. That was their training. So they don't fear anything. And when they are attacking the government troops, they come shouting with urulations, with noises, and it was very scary. Yet, we are killing our own people. That became a too much question for me. And these children, when they come back, they, whether through escaping or through uh, rescue by the government troops, because these are minors, children who didn't know anything, you know, they find themselves doing what they're doing because it has already been manipulated in their mind. That became a big concern for me. I felt hurt, angry over God. I felt angry over the government. I felt angry, why us? I never had any solution. So I remained with the poison for the rest of my life because there was no solution. I didn't know anything I could do. It was just for me. It was just in there. Until a time came that I went to the university, did economics in the university. I did economics. It was helpful to go and help in the government offices. And that was my first job. I was not happy. But remember, when I went to the university, I'd already received Jesus Christ as my Lord and personal Savior. But so many things were not answered in my life. Because even at the university, when I return back for holidays, I'm still living in the same struggle. From 1986 and 2004 is when I finished my university. Woo was still in Northern Uganda. In one of the primary schools, what did they do in the primary school? They got the head teacher or the principal and brought the him and children came time for school in the morning. They thought, ah, oh, it is time for school. When the children were ready, that's when they showed up and surrounded the entire school. After surrounding the entire school, children were there, captured, they can't go anywhere. They cut the head teachers in their prison into the pieces. So there were so many questions, even when we were believers, we still wondered why God allows such, such big things happen in the lives of people. Where is God when things like that happened. If he is divine and all-powerful, why can't he just stop the things? We didn't have any answers to those. So our resentment remained in God until when 2006 came, when my people are still living in IDP camps. My life and my path cross with a clinical psychologist from Australia. We sat together, we, he shared with us what he wanted to do. And I told him, if you want these things to happen, let us make it culturally sensitive. Because certain things does not work according to certain cultures. We designed and developed this program together. I tell you, this was amazing. It became a very successful two years research with a control group and it became very successful. When the training was happening, that was the time I started receiving my personal healing. Answers like, where was God when these things were happening? If he's all powerful, why didn't he do something? I started hearing the answers. I started hearing the first time what they call snake bite. And I started arguing before, understand that, if 
It is the snake bite that kill, not the poison. If the snake didn't bite me, how would the poison enter? I said, no. This, there are many snakes who bite, which bites, I mean, but doesn't inject the poison. And there are other snakes which are non-poisonous, but they bite. So it's definitely not the bite that kills, it's the poison. And I started seeing the anger, the unforgiveness, the pain towards group of people, towards certain family, towards God. The answer started unfolding and falling and I saw the reality has come. So definitely I began to see healing begins in my life. And that was the beginning of trauma healing in my life. When I lost many people in the family, I lost people in the community, I have relatives actually and uh, neighbors who are not relatives, whose children were abducted and they never returned also. There are quite a number. Um, I remember one scenario that happened in, like, the next neighbor in the family, in the village. Um, we don't know what happened, but the children were just playing in the compound, in the next house, and and they found greenet. We don't know how the greenet dropped, whether the rebels had passed sometime and their greenet passed, I mean dropped there. Children, they didn't know anything. They sat there and they started removing the greenet. They removed the greenet, by the way. Three died at the spot. It was terror in my neighborhood. It was a difficult thing. And uh, knowing God and forgiveness or forgiveness, we didn't understand the definition. It was very difficult. And I found out that forgiveness does not happen in a day. When I learned the meaning of forgiveness, there are two definitions that, there are many definitions, but two, that is my top. One says forgiveness is a gift that you give to somebody who doesn't deserve. That is one of my best. Number two, forgiveness is a conscious daily choice that you give to someone. Forgiveness of yesterday does not keep me today. Consciously, I have to let go the heart every day. A conscious choice daily to let go any heart in your life. I began to see that, yes, I had forgiven, I had spoken it, you know, but it was my lips. And one of the things that we realized, forgiveness doesn't mean you become a friend of somebody. We were lied to that, why don't you greet the, shake the hand of somebody, oh, go and hug, go and visit the person, go and tell the person, that's not true. That's more of reconciliation, not forgiveness. Forgiveness, you don't have to know the person or meet the person or be a friend to that person. And when I got to know that, that was the beginning of daily healing. Conscious daily choice to let go the heart also became a conscious healing within me that I began to see life in another level. So it didn't happen in a day. Um, to this day, sometimes when I think of what happened, I may have memories that are very emotional, that I may still shed tears, but that didn't or wouldn't mean I've not let go of the past. I've moved on, but it's sad that I don't have the brothers. It's sad that I don't have my sister. You know, I don't know if she 
she, she died in the crossfire. Or oh, who buried the body, you know? Yeah. Is it the vultures? Is it the animal that ate the flesh? I don't know. So when you think and process a lot of those things, it is difficult. It is very difficult. And um, I remember very well that this is very special to me. This statement is very special to me. I was so hard that I told God, if I come to heaven, I have a lot of questions for you. A lot. And I kept saying it every time, every time. And one day, clearly, the Lord even spoke to me. And the question came, who am I even to ask who God is? And I repented from that day. I'm sorry. I am just somebody that he chose to have a relationship with, not because of any importance. And... Um, I have no question to God when I go to heaven. He knows what he's doing. He sees what is happening. Evil is not from him, but he has given me the choice. And um, I don't call it a mistake, but the fact that God gave free will and choice to man, is a, it's something that if I was not a believer and a Christian, I would say that was a wrong choice, Lord. Because it's one of the most difficult things for man to choose what is necessary. Inviting God to be part of the things. And I think um, I would tell the world, we blame the, we blame the creator, we blame God, we blame what? God is there every day. He's just waiting on us. We are the one who are delaying our choice to be healed, to forgive and let go the heart. It is not based on God. It's based on our choice. If I have a touch, I don't, it is me to use the touch well at night to go to the direction I want. Nobody's going to come and point for me the direction. You imagine if you're walking with a touch, and you're going this direction with guys behind you. You don't walk like showing the light back to them and say, hey guys, come well, come well. Where are you going? It is you to make a choice, move in your direction well, the rest will follow your path. If somebody doesn't follow closely, it's their problem. So many times in this context, I realize that it is not about God, it's about us. And that has brought a deep, deep, deep healing to me. I have to make the right choice to live according to his will and desire. Then the rest is well for me. In 2006, when we started uh, the research with this clinical psychologist, after two years the research was done, uh, published in British Journal for Clinical Psychologists. It was well, successful research. He headed back to Australia, and I saw the need beyond just a research. I saw in the research how people had hope again in their lives. People who had all post-traumatic stress disorders begin to receive their healing within a two weeks. It was a two week sessions where we start with building trust relationship with people. After that, we begin to share with people what is called vision. Any traumatic person who had gone through threatening life event in their life, they don't plan for tomorrow. We teach them and train on what is called vision. Then we begin to explore stress and trauma. In that, we talk about signs of stress. And everybody begin to say, how did you know that this was happening in my life? I feel like dying. I've lost hope. I feel like committing suicide. Anger is 
all my food every day. I am angry over everything. I hate everything. I don't see anything good. I see things which are not real. Every time I hear like somebody's calling me and my names, nightmares, bad dreams all the, all the time. I, when we mention all those things, they say, you know me. How did you know? They would say, come back tomorrow. They come, then we bring them the story of snake bite. When you're bitten by the snake, it doesn't kill you. It is the poison. And as we explain to them, what is the poison? The thing that the five senses experience. What you saw with your eyes, what you heard as your life being threatened, you're going to die. Some of you were forced to eat flesh. The smell of the blood and the taste of the flesh. And then you slept on dead bodies for days in order to survive. Many of the people in northern Uganda slept with dead body so that when anything happened, they say, oh, these are all dead bodies. And many survived through that. So from touch, smell, tastes, hearing, and sight. Then the sixth one we talk to people is what they call belief system. I'm going to die. I will not survive. Whatever you believe in becomes a problem. Then we begin to teach them, number one, when you're real bitten by snake, calm yourself down. If not, the poison will run crazy into your heart and it will spread all over your body. In the same way, if things happen to you, calm yourself down before you do anything. If you act faster, it's a mistake. Many times you will find that I would have done better. Then we begin to teach them how to calm themselves in a real sense of a situation in life. Then how do you get rid of the poison in your life? And then don't allow the snake to bite you for the second time. That analogy means certain things that may be living in that very community, the rebels are, every time they come, they abduct you. They abduct you. Change your location. Maybe go to some relative somewhere else. Or change so that you're not abducted again, which means you're not beaten by snake again. I saw that. Now we get into a very powerful analogy, knowing the voice of truth. All those becomes a big tool in restoring the lives of people. Then we get into what we call forgiveness and reconciliation. Oh, that is one of the amazing things. That actually, it's one of the best part of our program. He was done, gone. And I said, I saw this thing for two years and it's gone. I started crying to God. God, I saw the life of my people before the counseling program. And these people are going, this doesn't work. And as I continue to pray, the Lord gave me a vision and said, as the eagle reaches to an old age that the wings cannot flap to the highest places, the beaks cannot pick well, and the claws cannot hold, an eagle goes to the highest place, pluck all the feathers, breaks the brick, the beaks, and also break the claws, and hides itself in the rocks to die. For days, new claws will begin to come. New beaks would come, and feathers would come, and eagle will live again and fly to high places. That is why when you look at what gave us, God gave us, God said, start a ministry for the people of Northern Uganda, which will mean my people live again. And we came up with that vision, myself and my wife, and we started an organization called I Live Again Uganda because I was like a dead man. Actually, I would consider the people of Northern Uganda used to live like walking dead or the living dead. But through the trauma counseling and discipleship, people begin to realize there is new life. 
and people started having new hope. And if you look at uh, our logo, it is a mountain with an eagle. So the eagle is my people, by the way, flying again, having new hope again, having new identity when they have received their healing. And that is when in 2008, on the 25th of March, we started I Live Again organization. That is the beginning of it. Yes, I Live Again Uganda when it was formed, oh my goodness, we started heading to communities in villages, bringing healing, hope and identity in the lives of my people. That became the passion that I have in my life. It just runs all over my blood because I realized sitting on the desk in the office means nothing to me. Take me to the community and talk to the people who had lost hope. And as I began to teach and help and bring more people who believed in the visions, we started having more staff working and with us. We started with no money. I would get my salary from different places where I was working and pouring it to the people who were volunteering in I Live Again Uganda to continue the work. I had one person who just decided, I'm going to bless you with $300 every month. We started living and surviving on $300. And today, God has been amazing. We go to the community, meet with the local leaders. We have come here as an organization to talk to the community. As they come, we begin to do trauma counseling. Now, when we reach trauma counseling, I want to mention this. The best part of the entire trauma counseling for me from the beginning up to the end for two weeks is the part of forgiveness. We teach people, how long can you hold a stone in your hand? Whoever holds the longest has a gift. Oh, young people, older person, because I'm gonna have a gift. Everybody comes and they start holding it. The longer they hold, the more the hands get tired and you start feeling pain in the arms, it start going further to your body, to your heart, heartbeat increases, you find yourself even shaking. The longer you keep holding, the more pain you begin to get. And some people say, I don't want this competition, they drop. And they realize, oh, what a freedom, what a freedom. And then the rest are still holding. After all of that, they realize, oh, there is no gift. They were just checking on us. How long can you hold somebody in your heart? The longer you hold somebody, the more the pain you have. The freedom is not for the other person. The freedom is for you. So who forgives first? Who help others? to accept forgiveness first. The question is, who? Is it the perpetrator or the victim? And many people say, the perpetrator should be the first to seek for forgiveness. Oh no, they're the ones supposed to follow me. We tell them, no. There is no answer of who starts first. The one who is feeling the pain starts first. If the perpetrator feels like, oh, what has happened to me? What I did to the other people is too much. I did so bad. They are the one to seek healing first. So forgiveness starts with them. But if the victims are the one feeling the heart and the pain, you seek forgiveness within yourself. So it's not about who starts first, it's about yourself. And when I'm done, let me tell you the best moment when we're in the community. When we have done as a facilitator, our work is to facilitate discussion, not to fix people's problems. We facilitate as we discuss and talk and guide the people. Now, it reaches the point of forgiveness and we do it in group counseling. And soon, many people have understood, wow, I need to let go what has happened. But somebody say, stands up and says, no, whatever they did to me, I cannot let it go. This is something I've witnessed, most cases. 
it is the group who begins to teach the person. You mean you did not understand? This is how it's supposed to be. The freedom is yours. The facilitator now sits. They become the fellow facilitators or counselor to help this person in the community. And they will talk, this one will talk until the person gets the better understanding and say, okay, I'm ready to let go. Because we use what we call group counseling and similar age groups together. Sometimes you find the victims and the perpetrator are in that same group. That is where you see reconciliation happens. One of the most events that happened was a brother who was forced to kill his own brother. Other siblings hated him for killing his brother and his mother because he killed mother and, and the brother. They forced you to do that. And everybody in the family said, that boy must die. Should never return back home. When he returned back home, family members were waiting for opportunity to kill their own. Why did he kill his own brother and his own mother? He was forced to do that. And do you know what happened? In the forgiveness, when it was... There's so many explanations of how we do it in, 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 in the group counseling. Everybody now started what? You did not hear the facilitator. They begin to teach him and everybody was talking over him, talking over him. And soon, the two came to understanding for the first time, hugging, embracing, and accepting. This is now the only brother I have. This is the only sibling I have. Let us be one in t instead of staring ourselves. Reconciliation happening within the group. Amazing. Now, that is the point where we bring God at a deeper level. Where were you, God? Anybody with the Bible? If they don't have the Bible, we always work with the Bible. We went as community workers, not as a believer or Christian. But at the end, where now we are bringing God, that is when they realize, oh, they're using the Bible. Okay, it's fine. Let me hear what they say. God, you don't understand how we feel. Let's look. In Hebrews, God himself through Christ suffered the same pain. He understands it. Oh, you mean he also understands? God watches over the wicked and the righteous. You mean you have seen what my people have done? God, they cannot just go like that. There must be some vengeance for these people. Oh, what does Romans say? Vengeance belongs to me. So God is going to repay for what happened? Yes. Leave it to God. And people begin to understand. We take discipleship program. People begin to know God at a deeper level. And people willingly confess Christ as their Lord and Savior. So those are now two departments. Trauma counseling and discipleship. And then we get to what we call community development. We believe that every community needs to develop. Development is not defined in one way only. Development in your perspective is different from the development in other places. We found communities that say development for us is people stopping and to abuse alcohol. If alcoholism is stopped in this community, this community will develop. So let us fight uh, alcoholism in our community. That's our approach. This community will say tree planting will be development for us. We go and give seedlings and train them. For us, we want businesses, small village vegetable stall, and uh, we call it village saving and loan scheme, give them share loans and help them. In other places, they choose to say, no, when we raise children in the best way of moral, that is development. So we go in community development based on the society. And then the fourth program we have is what we call resettlement. War happened in northern Uganda. People were forced. Over 1.2 million people left their homes, were in camps for decades. The rebels would still come in the camp and abduct and kill people. So many people ran from their village in the camps 
up to capital city of Uganda, Kampala, and lived in a slum where their only survival is stone quarry and pepper beets making. And many who lived there, lost relatives home, have no survival back in the village. And many of them want to go back to their village and start again from there. So I Live Again Uganda has a department called Resettlement Program to take them back to the village and begin new life. So we provide seeds, we provide household items, we provide uh, tools to start work in the garden, we build for them houses um, and help with education uh, for two years for their children. And uh, that has been another great department. And then another thing that we do is God led us through war. We have the experience of war and we survive through it. How about the refugees who have entered the country from South Sudan, from DR Congo, from Eritrea, from Somalia, from all surrounding neighboring countries of Uganda? I live against, found one thing. And this is a very special quote for I Live Again, Uganda. The absence of war, I mean, the silence of gun is not the absence of war. The war still rages in our hearts, in our minds. I want to say it again. The absence of guns or the silence of gun is not the absence of war. The war still rages in our mind, in our hearts. So the people who have experienced war all over the world, the silence of the guns in their country is not the absence of war. Who has shifted from the battlefield is now in their hearts, in their minds. The memory is huge. We said, God, you help us through. We need to help also the refugees. So we went and seek pepper, work with the government of Uganda through the office of the prime minister where we were given permit to go and help refugees. We are doing so well, reducing what we call suicide among refugees. We are helping so much for people who ran from their countries in South Sudan, now in Uganda, to live again even when they're in another country. Those are key departments that God has helped us. Now we have come with one specific thing, a vision that God gave us. God gave us a vision called the Potter's House, a place of encounter. This is a place where we are going to have training and teaching. We want to see that people come into that place, receive counseling and be trained also in that place and go out and help others. We want this place to be for refreshment and rest. People who have been traumatized with their experience. Can you find an environment that gives you rest? It is a place where people will come and we will do uh, what we call team building, high ropes, low ropes, development of the people into that place. It's, a, it's going to bring caregivers, it's going to bring pastors, church leaders, because they're in the front line. We want to see the frontliners who are there helping victims of and survivors of war to come and receive their healing and go back refreshed to start a new work. So that is what I Live Again Uganda is doing. When we talk about uh, I Live Again vision, I Live Again's vision is a world where everyone has healing, hope and identity. Many people wonder what do you mean with identity? Identity in Christ. We can do everything in this world by giving food, handouts, and giving accommodation. And if people don't find out their identity is in Christ or in God, there's going to be a problem. Your identity that has been on Benson, Benson is going to be gone at some point. Or Benson will not be reachable at some point. But all the time, God is reachable. All the time, God is all present. So if you find your identity in God, all the time, Christ, I'm here. It is hurting right now. I want peace right now. I want healing. 
God is a God of all mankind. He will be right there to give you that which you desire, that which will glorify himself. And it is very key unto us. And we have seen, as I live again in Uganda, that's what we call resettlement program and also what we call trauma counseling in forgiveness. I will start with forgiveness. Uh, when we come to forgiveness, uh, we talk about we were once enemies with God, but God himself has reconciled us back to him through Christ. So it is very easy to say, love my friend, love my neighbor, love my mother, my father. But how about loving your enemy? Can you pray for your enemy? Now, we teach these people uh, that we meet in the communities, people who are struggling with the issues of forgiveness and reconciliation. Some of the people that we work with, the approach of just sitting and thinking and forgiving somebody doesn't make sense for them. They want to meet the person face to face to first forgive, but they don't know that they're already going to the step of reconciliation. So we have an approach of teaching people how to approach your enemy. We teach them, when you're going to approach the enemy, one of the things we teach them is, you go as a humble person. When you go, never be the first to speak what took you. Carry a gift. But the gift should be very insignificant. Something that cannot be noticed. Something that should not take the position of your trip. So small thing, maybe sweet for the kids, maybe something that you just go and you start. But when you go there, the enemy knows already that you are my enemy. They are waiting to hear you to start, but never ever start. It has worked to the fullest. I want to give an example. A lady who had and we tell them, it's your choice. It's not the choice of the facilitator or I live again to tell you, go and visit. If you feel it is important, don't ever carry anything important. So I'll give you two examples. A lady who had an husband, her husband died from the hospital. She brought the body home and the sisters to the husband, the late husband, refused for the body to enter the house. And like, what is wrong? This is our house, my house with my husband. Because the husband died with HIV AIDS, they said, if you take the body of your husband inside, it's going to spread the virus to everybody in the family. You can't put the body inside. So what is wrong with you? Where has it ever been in the culture that a dead body, whether it died of HIV AIDS, wouldn't enter there. They shifted the problem from the dead body and put something deeper on this woman. Said, if dead bodies are very important to you, why don't you go and collect the bones of your brothers who died when the rebels abducted them and their bones are rotting in the woods, in the jungle there. Why don't you go and collect the bodies? She stopped weeping for the dead husband and started crying for her two brothers who were abducted by the rebels, walked with them and reached in nowhere, no man's land where there's nobody and killed those two bodies and their body remained there. And nobody even saw the body and began to, they're reminding her, go and collect the bodies. She cried. She made a vow. I'm going to bury my husband and collect all my properties and return back to my mother's house. Exactly that's what she did. She never even ate anything. Carried all her things, went. Lived all those years. Her children were already grown up. That is for the first time she's hearing the real teaching of forgiveness. 
I didn't know what was going in her mind. She later left, went and bought one kilogram of sugar and two bars of soap and boarded a taxi to go and visit one of the sister who, of the, hus the late husband who insulted her. When she reached closer to home from a distance, the children of their enemy saw from afar, they ran with excitement. The wife to our uncle, our delayed uncle finally is coming. They grabbed her with excitement. The mother, that enemy, saw from a distance, entered our house, didn't come out. The children were very happy. They walked home, they came home. She just remained quiet because she learned, don't say I've come for reconciliation, whatever. When she entered inside, the enemy was there, the children were there. The children became the shield and started speaking straight away. She didn't say anything and say, our mother is very bad. She has disconnected us from all our relatives. We don't know any of our relatives. What she does is very bad. We don't like it. And mommy, you see, now she has come. We are She's just smiling, happy. She didn't say a word of anything of the past. And passed on the kill of sugar and then the soap. She stayed. They lived as if there was nothing that ever happened. The children were all around her. The excitement was huge. When she said she was now heading back, she's the one that went and got two chicken, big cock and a hen as a gift to her. She went back home, very excited. Two day, days later, she saw the entire elders from the side of the other woman who was there, including that woman, all came travel from a very far distance visiting her and calling for forgiveness, asking her, oh, <laughs> oh man, I remember that was, um, was passionate when uh, she shared and uh, crying and saying, it is the elders who are now seeking, asking for her. We want to be one. We, let's leave what has happened in the past. And it became a powerful thing that, uh, it is one of the most powerful reconciliation I saw in uh, families that suffered. Um, I didn't tell them to go. People just accepted her. And then life began in amazing, amazing way. Another one story which is brief, not long. Um, this is a woman we met in a Choli quarter in Kampala who ran from the village because of the war and went. Why did she run? The brother to her dad brought rebels, killed her dad, and nine people were lying on the road of our village. People ran and swore never ever to go back to that village. All the siblings scattered in their own life, surviving their own for years, over 15 years coming to 20 years. That's when we went to Kampala with our program. When we were there, we reached a point of forgiveness, taught about forgiveness and what reconciliation would mean. We ended, little did we know, this poor lady who is surviving in Kampala raised some money, boarded a bus, and headed to the village. She bought one thing. She remembered the uncle, the brother to the dad, used to love a specific type of trouser is mostly known for all the people. Not expensive, very cheap. She bought one. 
And that is what she I used to approach the uncle and said, Uncle, I've come to visit you. This is your gift. The uncle knows there's a problem, but she's taught never to start. Immediately, the uncle said, received the trust and said, I'm not going to talk. Can you call all your siblings who ran away? I want to talk. So he took her another time to connect to all the siblings who scattered in different places, and they came together. They wept together. 100 acres of land, piece of land, he passed to them, come back home. She went back to Chilko and said, I want to return back home. And one of our resettlement of program officer processed everything back to home. She's happily resettled, and that man leaves the next neighbor and live, living happily ever. One of the best reconciliation I saw. So it is a deep thing when it comes to understanding identity in Christ. Do you know what she did? She's a woman that doesn't know how to read the Bible, doesn't know how to write, but in our program, that's when she gave her life to Jesus. When she gave her life to Jesus, we give Bibles to everyone. You know how to read or not. When she begins to pray, the Lord will tell her, go to Isaiah 43. She doesn't know what I mean. She carries her Bible, runs to one of the friends, say, help me read. I was praying and God said, read this. And it would be exact situation of her life. When she came back to the village, what did she do? She organized community, come and start a church. They even started a church. A woman who does not know how to read and write had influence and reconciliation, bringing Christ to the community and accepting church to be in her own land. That was a typical. So reconciliation, peace is a big thing for I Live Again Uganda. My biggest struggle working as a founder of I Live Again Uganda, I would say two areas. One is the negligence of the world, international bodies, the churches on mental health. It is not considered as a priority. Yet that is something, if well considered, is going to create less struggle in other areas. The effect of trauma or the struggle in the mental health, which has been neglected, is causing more problem across the globe. Things that are causing trauma-related issues of the world, bringing depressions, dissociations, anxiety at the different levels, is increasing at a super high level. War to natural disasters, to domestic violence, the level is so much increasing. And yet the world are prioritizing something else. With even post-COVID, COVID is still there in other world, is still a big thing. It's being neglected in the area of mental health. They are focusing, have you vaccinated, uh, quarantine, whatever. They are forgetting what they call the, the mental health. The struggle that is coming from, from out of it is my big struggle to the world, is a big struggle to the church. Refugees are going to resettle in different Western worlds. What is the country doing as a priority in the mental health? And then tomorrow they say, um, there, there is high suicide among the refugees. What did you do with their mental health? They are creating high expenses on the government because dependency has risen to the highest level. Why? Because they have not settled the mind. I struggle why they don't value that. I consider if I can have a platform to tell the world, mental health should become one of the basic needs of human. That is struggle number one. 
Struggle number two that I have is not that what we are doing is the most important thing, but I would consider as the best things that we are doing to human life. Platforms, people who have resources are hard to find for people who are doing the best things in the world. I believe, I live again in Uganda with the team, are doing one of the greatest things. We don't want only to help people here in Uganda. We want to go to the Middle East. We want to go to other parts of Asia. We want to go to Europe, you know. I live again in Uganda, would do great work with Ukrainians and Russians, by the way. I live again, would do a lot in African countries. But resources are going somewhere else. I struggle with that. We, I don't understand, and the desire of people to help others are in something else. I struggle with that. If I would have all the resources, I would be the happiest person to train, travel, support, and bless the people. At the end of it, I want Christ to be known. I would encourage others to pursue peace as the best way of life. The day you all think about yourself, everything, me, me, know that life is the beginning of struggle with you. If you want to see life at its fullness, let others be number one. When people are at peace, you will be at peace. When people are reconciled, reconciliation's effect will approach you. But many times people want to say, my area, my court, my boundary, my life has gone beyond me. We call it a global village. The world is full of networking. The world is full of everybody coming as one and helping others who have not joined into the family become one. So I will tell the world in one way, knowing Christ, knowing the way to peace, when Christ was about to die, he said, peace I live with you, not as the world does. Why didn't he say, Food, I live with you. Why didn't he say, car, I live with you? Why didn't he say, hope, I live with you? As much as hope is important, when peace is not there, you struggle to receive the hope. And that's the last word he left with his disciple and the people. When Christ resurrected, the first word is Paul, peace be with you. And as Paul said, as much as it depends on you, try to live at peace with everyone. So the choice is in your hand. You want to be happy? Bring peace. Okay? And when you bring peace, we say as I live again Uganda, I live a Again, Uganda, this is a very core statement that must be well understood. We are not peacekeepers. We are peacemakers. United Nations are struggling to keep peace. It will never end. War will never end. Struggle will never end because they are trying to keep peace. If you make peace, it is sustainable. And that is what I'll tell the world. Be peacemakers and you'll be a happy man. And you'll be a happy woman. And you'll be a happy child somewhere. God bless you.